Hey, it's Dave from Test Double. Thinking of web applications in terms of state machines is not a new idea. In fact, it's become increasingly more popular in the past few years that teams are spending significant amounts of time breaking down their application into states managed by front-end frameworks. Now, whether you use something like Redux, MobX, or maybe even something framework agnostic like XState, it's clear that thinking about our web applications in terms of these state machines is occurring much more frequently. With all this focus on state transitions and the benefits that come with structuring our applications like this, I found there's still an area that is often overlooked, the visual or presentation layer. CSS is incredibly powerful, yet frequently misunderstood by most developers, which often leads to derision of the language. I think this is mostly due to a fundamental error in the way that web developers manage presentation, often focusing their efforts on conditional logic and templates instead of a more flexible application of state-specific CSS selectors to HTML elements. In this screencast, we're going to take a look at a simple example UI, a multi-selectable list of users that a designer might have provided in mock-up form for us as web developers to decompose. Now, if you prefer to learn by reading, please check out the full article linked in the video description below. Otherwise, let's get started. All right, let's dive in here. So we're talking about CSS as the visual state machine. And I mentioned before in the introduction that there was a simple UI that we were going to recreate. Let's take a look at the example here in this animated GIF. So we can see that there's a number of interactions at play. And at first glance, these might seem simple enough that uh, we would be tempted to solve the problem without putting much upfront thought into it. However, I think despite the simplicity of this example, there's probably enough complex states here uh, to enumerate that we should spend some time thinking about them before we dive into creating this UI, especially considering we were talking about state machines and thinking of our the presentation of our application in terms of states. So we've got uh, a selected state where we can see that a user can click and then the, the icon turns into a checkbox. We've got an unselected state where the icon becomes an empty checkbox. Uh, we have a hover state with no selections uh, where the snowman icon shows up um, for the hovered row. And the hovered row also changes to an empty checkbox uh, just as a way to give a user a hint that there is a potential for them to, to select an item. Then we have hovering with one or more selections uh, where all the unselected row icons remain as empty checkboxes and the yellow highlight appears on the hover row. And then we also have a, a sort of a derived state which is one or more selections that are active. And in that case, all the icons change to empty checkboxes to indicate the ability to select multiple rows. So we could think about interaction design, we could think about accessibility concerns, uh, but I think we're going to put those aside for now and just think about the states that we've enumerated and how to build this UI. And this is a good question, how should we manage these states? Should the logic live in our template or in our style sheets? And I think that's ultimately the conundrum that a lot of developers get into when they start uh, thinking in terms of decomposing complex states into their UI. And so we're gonna take a look at uh, the first approach, which is working with conditional logic and templates. And we're gonna use something called Svelte. And if you aren't familiar with Svelte, it's a compiler that takes uh, as input one or more Svelte files with sort of regions of functionality based on JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. If you're familiar with Vue and you've used that before, uh, you'll feel right at home. Uh, Vue has a .vue file, Svelte has a .svelte file. Um, and it's a little bit of a different take than something like React uh, or Ember or Angular, but as we'll see, um, there are pieces that overlap in functionality. and uh, the, the other main difference is that Svelte um, doesn't ship its runtime to the browser. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about that, we're not going to cover that in this screencast. I would definitely recommend watching uh, this excellent talk called Rethinking Reactivity. You can either check out all of the resources listed at the bottom of this post, or you can check out the video linked in the description below. But uh, Rich Harris, the creator of Svelte, has some really cool ideas uh, that talk about why Svelte was created. So you can check out Svelte at svelte.dev and uh, the tutorial is a, is a great place to start. So if you are just wondering what uh, Svelte is all about and how to get into it, I would recommend starting there. But for now, uh, we're gonna stop with the uh, sort of dictation from the blog and we'll jump into our first implementation. So I have a basic project uh, set up here and to start, there's a script called dev uh, Svelte comes with Rollup as its package dependency manager tool slash bundler. Um, 
And so uh, you can scaffold out a project. There's a, a template you can get. You can check all that out in the Svelte tutorial. We're going to start with our app.svelte file. And we're going to start with our list of users. And so the idea is thinking about that UI that we got from our designer. We want to decompose this into um, some representation on the screen. And again, I mentioned before Svelte has regions of functionality. So a .svelte file consists of a script block where all of our behavior as JavaScript goes, a style block where our style sheets can go, and then just HTML. Um, if you're familiar with Vue, you might uh, be thinking, why didn't they have a template uh, directive? They just don't in Svelte. Anything that comes outside of the style or script will automatically try to be rendered into the root of the component um, as a template. So let's think about getting our list of users on the screen first. And we're going to do it with a table, because I think a table um, makes the most sense. So let's just try and get our list of users on the screen to start. So in uh, Svelte, we have iterators. We can do each users as user. And the cool thing is all of the template context, um, so the fact that I can see users inside of here, Svelte auto wires all that stuff up. And again, it's a, it can do that because it's a compiler. Uh, and the, the value that's emitted in the bundle file is literally just DOM directives. And we might take a look at a little bit at that later. So let's get our users onto the screen. So we want a table row for each user. And within there, we can see that our users have a name and an email. So let's put those in just as placeholders. We use single curlies in Svelte, which is similar to other languages. Let's get that up and running here. I think that's on 5,000. There we go. And we'll just make things bigger so that we can kind of see. Uh, the default Svelte configuration has live reload. So as we go changing this, uh, we'll be able to see what happens. So there's our list of users, not too exciting. So we need to think about how to model uh, the complexity of those states that we're working with. Um, and we and we also need to model the icon that showed up in that uh, that animated GIF. So let's think about where to put the icon. Uh, we're going to do that here in another table data tag. Now let's give it a class of template icon. Let's give it some properties of height and width, just so that when we hover, they, they aren't going to jump around. And this is where we start thinking about um, selection. So we need some way to flag our users as selected. And the, the, I like to start in the template often because I think that's where most developers start. And so if we add a conditional here that says, if the user that we are currently iterating over is selected, um, then we can render the checkbox. So let's do that. And this HTML uh, directive in Svelte tells it to um, unescape the value so that it doesn't uh, put the HTML entities in place. The other condition we have um, is if the user isn't selected, then uh, we want some HTML with the unchecked box. And then we also have another else condition uh, to account for, for the snowman. And these conditions aren't quite as truthful as we need. We also need uh, to determine uh, the state where overall there's a selection uh, so that we can alternate between showing a single checked box or all of the checked boxes. Uh, so we'll do that with a Boolean that we're going to create called has selection. And that also modifies this condition. So let's read through it. If the user selected and we have a selection, we're going to show that checked box. Otherwise, if the, if the user isn't selected, but we do have a selection, we're going to flip all of the icons to an unchecked box. And the final condition is just the default condition with the snowman. So obviously, this isn't going to work, and we'll get a compile error, um, which is one of the benefits of Svelte. And so let's start adding the pieces that we need in our JavaScript. And we can do that up here with HTML entities. Uh, so we have a snowman. We have an unchecked box. And we have a checked box. And a great place to grab icons, uh, if you are interested, is this TopTal website that shows a bunch of HTML entities. And if we search for snowman, we can see we've got the Unicode, the hex code, and the HTML code. So those are the values that I'm going to use. Uh, I'm going to use the HTML entities code. So I'll just grab that. 
paste it in there. And the unchecked box is ampersand pound 9744. And the checked box is ampersand pound 9745. So if we save that, now we still need to define our has selection. And the thing about uh, has selection is it's going to be a computed property. Uh, and we define a computed property in Svelte using kind of a cryptic syntax, but it's essentially valid JavaScript using what's called a label. And so in Svelte, any reactive statement uh, is prefixed with a dollar sign. So if we say has selection equals, uh, and we'll just use a function to say, are any of the users selected? And that'll get us back to compiling. So now we have our default state. We can see the snowman. Uh, but we don't have any way to trigger a selection. So let's build that part next in the JavaScript. So we're going to create a function called select user. And we are going to look at the users. And we want to find a given user in there where the user that we're looking for is name matches the user's name that we passed in. Once we grab that, we can use the spread operator to create a new assignment. And the reason we use, need to use the spread operator is because internally Svelte uh, won't emit change tracking in its compiled output unless it detects the spread operator or some other way to uh, manage creating a new object and assigning it to a value. Uh, and you can read a little bit more about that in the Svelte tutorial under the section on updating arrays and objects and reactivity. So with that in place, we're going to find the user that matches the name that we're in here. We're going to take the existing property so that we don't lose name and email. And then we're going to add a new property called selected. And it's just going to be the opposite of whether the user was selected. And because we don't have a value for that, which is undefined, it'll course it into a, a Boolean value of true or false. And just so we can see that working, let's add a, a log statement. So we're going to log out. Uh, whether the user name was, and we want to determine if they're selected or deselected. Uh, so if they're selected, then we'll say the opposite because we're going to be inverting it. And let's log that out. So now we need a way to trigger that uh, when we click. We don't have any way to do that yet. So that click is going to go onto our table row. So let's do that. And we do that with these on click directives. This look, will look very familiar to you if you've done any React. And we'll say we'll pass in the user that we're referencing here. So we can see that we've got a preliminary build of that. We've got our, our logging worked out. The icon states are being managed. They're kind of jumping around a little bit. We can fix that up with some CSS. And as we move forward to, towards the rest of the states, uh, we can control that. So, so let's think about where we're at. We've kind of covered our bases with uh, the selected state. So I can click on one of these. Um, and I can see uh, if I have one or more selections active, then all the other icons are flipping. So the, the conditional logic in the template is working to show those states. Uh, we don't have our hover states, which is sort of a failing of uh, putting all our conditional logic into the template to manage these states. Uh, and so that's one piece that we're missing. But we do have selected, unselected, and then this one or more active selection state covered with the template. And I think that this is a, a pattern that lots of people use. Right? They will encode presentational concerns into their template in order to achieve a result. And it does work. But the challenge being uh, that as we scale up and build larger and larger templates in our application, there becomes this mix of concerns of uh, presentational logic in our templates, as well as uh, data, uh, displaying the data. So I, I don't think that scales very well as you grow an application in terms of size and complexity. So let's refactor this. We'll leave our table-based uh, select in, in place, and we'll just kind of call it out here. I will say this is a template managing presentation. And let's duplicate that. And we'll add another one. And we will call it where the CSS manages the presentation. So we're going to get rid of all of this conditional logic in uh, our template. And we need a way uh, with our style sheets to sort of transfer all of these states that are encoded uh, in the conditional logic into a style sheet. And so I'm going to get rid of that class as well. Uh, let's just call it icon here. 
and uh, we're going to delete all of the contents of this and this just becomes an empty td and let's just stick it up here for now and comment it out so that we know where we need to go with our refactor so our our uh, template down here still works our template and now we're going to refactor to our css so similar to how we used the html entities encoded in javascript we can do the same thing in CSS using CSS variables. So let's define some CSS variables. And the browser support for this is pretty good. So we're going to have unchecked box. And we're going to have checked box. And we're going to have snowman. And the root selector, uh, you can define variables other places, but the root selector in this case is scoped uh, because of Svelte's compilation to automatically generate randomized styles so that you don't get a uh, cascade bleeding in and affecting things um, or subsequently if there was another component like a child component contained within this uh, app.svelte file um, these styles would only affect uh, the the root level here they wouldn't affect the uh, the child underneath let's add some basic styling to our td elements we'll just give them a little bit of padding to space it out let's add our hover styles that one's an easy one so we want cursor pointer to let users know that this is an interactable thing. And then we want to put background color uh, yellow so that we see the hover. So there we go, we've got that. We've got this funny gap between things. I think we can eliminate that by adding uh, self spacing zero on our table. There we go, now we have a nice row selected. Let's port that over to our other template as well. And they're still kind of jumping. We'll fix those in a, in a sec. Okay, cool. So we have our basic hover state managed in CSS. So now let's think about how to encode these pieces into uh, our styles. So let me paste that back in here. So let's start with the first one. And we'll say uh, if the user selected, let's have that be selected. And we're going to select that icon and we're going to use a pseudo selector after and we're going to use generated content to uh, add the value of our variables which we'll define in a sec and so this is going to be content var snowman and actually this is just going to be our default one of snowman so any icon uh, class element within a class of icon in this case the td is going to have a content of our snowman. So let's put the snowman in there, encoded in a different way. And let's put the other ones in there. 02611, 02610. And this is going to have a compiler error. So let's just get rid of that for now. So there's our snowman showing up. And our selection is working still. But now we need to also encode the rest of those styles into the style sheet. Let's put some default styles on the icon. So any icon and, and uh, the template icon in our template managed presentation layer. Uh, we're going to put a property of display flex on those and then we'll justify the content center and that should eliminate the jump that was happening when we selected those things. Yeah, there we go. Now we don't get that jump between the rows. Okay, cool. So we sorted out that. Now we need to finish the rest of those states to get the unchecked box and the checked box to work. So let's do that. So we're going to say that uh, any selected will have a class of selected and its icon is going to change to the checked box. And we're also going to need to have the hover state. Let's see if this one works for now. So it doesn't work because we're not triggering that class of selected. So we can do that using a class bind template directive in our Svelte template. And let's do that on the TR. And because we have a Boolean property, it becomes pretty easy. So the syntax for this is class colon selected and then equals user dot selected. And now we can see that works. But now uh, when we have one selection, all the rest of the icons should default to um, the empty checkbox, which we haven't covered yet. So let's encode that one in our style sheet as well. And we can do that by adding a couple of classes uh, to our root element as well. Let's add the class of has selection that we defined as has selection. 
in our computed property here. And that way we have a styling hook to trigger uh, the conditional property of whether we, whether we have a selection or not. So in this case, let's say has selection dot selected dot icon dot after. And let's add the rest of them as well. Let's put another class on our table thinking about perhaps we want to extend this and make this a generic component that we can apply to any anything, uh, some selectable thing. So we're going to add a class of selectable. I like to do this as a way to sort of um, almost domain specify the domain of the thing that I'm working with uh, as a top level class. And it also gives us some flexibility since now we can say uh, any selectable that has a selection. Um, the selected icon after will be checked box and any selectable um, that does not have has selection. When we hover over the row, then the icon becomes the unchecked box. Let's see how that works. So now the hover is working, we can see there, but we need one more rule to also account for when we have a selection, um, any selection at all. So now we can ha say selectable dot has selection icon after, and we can combine it with that rule. And now we get all of the complex states decomposed. So we took one, two, three, four style rules to manage all of the different complex states that were previously listing in these um, blocks of conditional logic. Uh, but the advantage here is we've separated the the, the management of the presentational side and encoded those states. If we think of our, our CSS and our HTML and our JavaScript as a state machine, the CSS states um, and the application of those via JavaScript is now managing the presentation and our template just becomes a presenter of data, which I think is a better separation of concerns as we grow our application. Um, the, the visual presentational stuff goes into the style sheet and the template based stuff goes into the template where it belongs. And so this is how I prefer to manage um, my projects uh, dealing with managing complex states when it comes to presentation, encoding things in the style sheet as opposed to uh, encoding them in, in the template. Just because, yeah, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like this pattern scales well. You, and you get a, maybe you've been on a project before where you know uh, you jump into that one template and it's just this nested mess of presentation and data rendering concerns and you just can't really tease it apart. And so I, I really feel like this is a, a better path forward. But I'm interested to know what you think. Do you think this is a better pattern? Do you think this is complicated? Do you think it's, it's weird? Um, let me know in the comments below and I, I'd love to chat with you or reach out on Twitter. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed this screencast and learned a little bit about Svelte in the process. Uh, we'll dive into sort of more complicated features in Svelte in some follow-up screencasts that I'll be producing in the next few weeks. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching.